Tales from the Flipside family. I'm sorry for taking a week off, but business, job, family, everybody knows what that's like. So uh, yeah, but I'm back. And uh, we're looking at still a incredible mess that we have going on here, but we're in a full remodeling and staying open during it. But because, you know, everybody knows what's going on in the comic book industry, right? We, uh, is it imploding? Is it gonna end? It's not gonna go away. It's gonna change but there's a huge slowdown in comics and we have to pivot. And that's kind of what this show is about today. It, it is in pivoting. We talked about the video games uh, last time. This time we're gonna talk about toys and uh, other collectibles that you can sell online, eBay, um, Facebook Marketplace, uh, Mercaria. There's a lot of places to sell, you all know about them. Uh, I try not to use anything online, uh, but it seems like the more diverse stuff we have here at the shop that uh, brings a lot of people in and they get excited about it. So, you know, recently I bought all these and man, stuff, stuffed animals. Uh, a lot of people call them plushies now. They, these are really hot right now. I mean, I'm, I sold one for uh, $285 for a vintage one on, uh, a vintage gun on eBay about two months ago. And these sell really good. You know, I can pick them up for two and three dollars and they sell between 10 and 15. In the store, I don't have to put them online and lose a percentage, especially the Pokemon one. They sell really quick. So some of the other toys, you get some vintage He-Man stuff. You know, we got a whole bin of vintage He-Man. And they sell anywhere like without their weapons and their all their other parts. 15 to $25 for the for the common ones, but you know, there's some uncommon ones. Loose, you're gonna get 80 bucks for them. So keep an eye out for this and don't be afraid to buy. You know, if comic book collections aren't coming in and comics aren't really selling, you need to buy something to put out. Uh, the, we got, why we're remodeling the whole store is another thing is to re-merchandising, not really remodeling, more re-merchandising, changing the whole setup of the store creates excitement. People think there's a lot of new things uh, in and a lot of things happening. Uh, another thing that you can do is move a lot of your collection online. So I've got like 30,000 books that aren't out on my floor. There's no room for them. Uh, and they're just sitting in the basement and piled up in our second bathroom. It's crazy. It's everywhere. So what we started doing, and we did a show on TCG Player, and I showed everybody how to put their stuff up online if you're a, a comic book retailer. Uh, they have been, as I've gotten my numbers up, the sales have been uh, moving upwards, and they, it's going to be a really good income. We also we already have 65,000 items up on uh, TCG Player, mostly trading cards. But we have about 4,000 comics now, and we're reaping about $100 a week on those 4,000 comics. I figure if we just feed that out, if I had put 30,000 books up there, just easy math, might be able to do $500 uh, uh, a month maybe as much as $1,000 a month, because we're doing about $100 a week now. So that's another thing we've been focusing on and getting you know, everything up online that we can so that we can move some books to keep the income flowing in. Another thing we talked about was pull box and finally got signed up all ready to go and we started just started advertising for pull box and we've already added four new subscribers. It was so hard to add subscribers in the past and we are trying desperately to add those subscribers. We haven't even gotten uh, out to the rest of our area and we've like added four people. So we estimate that we might be able to add a total of 20 new subscribers and that would put us almost back up to uh, 40 and that would be fantastic. It also makes ordering a whole lot easier if you know what the people want. It automatically goes into the order. You don't have to worry about, did I forget this book? Uh, when I was adding up, did I add it up correctly? It, it's really a pain in this digital age to be able to use a product 
and, and get an outcome, a good outcome, should be no brainer. Should, shouldn't have to be going to paper and counting and, and writing it from one piece of paper to another piece of paper and then transferring it to computer. This is perfect. They sit at home, they look for previews world, they pick the comics they want. I give them an extra 5% off. So now, if you use Pullbox, you're gonna get 15% off of your comics. And I'm also giving them, uh, because it's really that great for me, another 10% off anything else in the store they wanna buy, they get a permanent 10% off. Plus we bag and board their comics. So, I mean, I don't know what more a subscriber would want. Maybe 30% off their books, but <laughs> we can't go there. Because uh, we're paying a higher percentage because we can't buy as many books as some of the bigger dealers. Uh, sadly, DC uh, has not come back to Diamond as even uh, on allowing them to distribute their books uh, as not an exclusive, but like as, a, as another distributor. They have brought a second distributor on out of Canada. Uh, but they're not in the previews world pull box. So I'm having to do any DC the old way. It takes me about three weeks to get my DC. And there was like three weeks to get your DC. Yes, Lunar will not ship your books unless you buying $125 uh, a week. Uh, so until you get up to that $125, they won't ship you your books. So I don't sell $125 a week in DC. So it takes me about three weeks to add up to that and then it all comes in and then people are behind in their books. So I'm, I'm looking at a couple of different ways to work with the DC uh, through other dealers. So we'll, we'll see about that. But again, what we're talking about is pivoting. So I have to tell my subscribers to DC, you won't get your books for two, three, maybe four weeks, depending on what they're coming out with. Oh, and guess what? DC just announced that they're gonna trim their line down. So not only do I have not enough to buy now, but they're gonna have less books for me to buy in the coming months. So it'll be even harder to get to 125. So I guess, you know, Lunar wants you to buy the independence that they carry through them instead of Diamond, but they don't have a previews world. So I'm gonna buy it all through Diamond. Um, I know, a lot of people before this all breakup happened, everybody was so sour on Diamond because they were, you know, it was kind of a monopoly. They, you know, they had a lot of warehouse issues with damages and stuff, but they always made the damages right. Yes, like if they couldn't replace a book, you only got the value you paid for it. And if it was a one in 25 and a one in 50, you missed out on the opportunity to sell that book at a higher amount. But it really wasn't that often. At least it wasn't for me. Um, I did have, I do still have damages from time to time, but I'm taking care of uh, either financially or book replacement. Uh, so, you know, it's the best you can ask for with being able to add all these tools into your system, plus getting the free Overstreet um, account also added on, which can be a management tool for you. But I get excited with buying stuff and different things and, and changing around the, the store. It, it, it gets everybody in, you know, in the neighborhood when they come in, they get excited. Now, because we can't afford to be closed for a week, we have to be open and do it. So instead of it taking one week and getting it done and knocking it out, it takes us several weeks. And collections don't stop coming in. Um, all other things don't stop happening. The comics come in uh, uh, weekly. Uh, magic drops, we have to have all the tables cleared off for Thursday and Friday for Magic tournaments. And we're gonna do an episode on, on TCG uh, trading card games and running tournaments and selling cards and, and, and how that works for us. And maybe you guys can tell us how it works for you. Uh, it works very successfully for us. It's kind of one of the things that keeps our lights on. So another thing I bought, you know, it gets brought in and uh, you know, I'll buy it. So. The, these are bike badges from the 40s. Actually, the Schwinn is actually probably from the 60s, but the, the Shelby Flyer and the Monarch and the Roadmaster are all probably from the 40s, early 50s. Um, they're actually not a lot of money. A lot of people save these, and a lot of the bike shops from back then would order a bunch of these because they would break and people like uh, would want a new one for their bike, so they kept them in stock. So these are actually, old new stock.
but still, you know, 25, maybe $50 on the on one of the ones for it. Uh, then we got, you know, Franklin Mint Stuff. Franklin Mint Stuff does pretty good. So these are pewter, and these are all hood ornaments from all the cars from like the 1910s all the way to like the 1940s or 50s. So they're on a little piece of wood, they're a pewter figure, it says what company they're from, you know, Studebaker, Packard, Buick, um, and it has all of them, Cadillac, it's got some ones that I've never heard of. So, you know, I bought a lot on that and, you know, you take a shot at a change, you know, I gotta probably sell it online if I wanna sell it quickly. If I wanna sell it slowly, I probably could put it out. We'll figure it out. But it came in in a, in a bunch of lot. For, and another thing is I've talked about uh, when I was did my vacation video, uh, when I was talking about buying. So this is from one of my clean out guys. And you wanna take care of your clean out guys if you can. If you have the money to buy what they bring in, uh, you don't, of course, don't wanna overpay. But if you can give them some cash, First, even if it's not stuff you do every day, uh, it keeps that relationship going. Uh, I made a good bit of money. <laughs> he brought me three fire hydrants. And uh, because my main gig is working with firemen and policemen, uh, I, my main gig is at the supervisor at a 911 center. So what I, I just told the guys I had fire hydrants and you know I made a quick, quick sale of three fire hydrants. And my clean out guy did well, I did well, and people got what, it's hard to come by uh, a fire hydrant. That's finding, if you can find buyers, buy it and sell it. Like make money for your business in any way you can. Uh, there's a, people are always looking to get into your pocket. Every internet company takes a percentage. Uh, your lights have to be paid. You know, you gotta buy garbage bags, you have to buy toilet paper. Listen, if you're running magic tournaments, that bathroom is flushing every 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, you have 30, 40 people in here and they're eating fast food or local food. And, uh, you know, so there's a run on that bathroom. You better have toilet paper and hand washing material and uh, paper towels. And so we use Uline, it's a one day ship. And they, they've been great with us. And it's, you know, it's affordable, but it's another cost. Uh, then you have to have all your protective items for all your comics. You know, when you sell them, you gotta have bags and boards and you gotta be making them. You gotta pay somebody to make them. Alphabetizing books after you put them online, you have to pay somebody to do that. I don't pay my wife and she does it. So <laughs> if you have family members, I'm gonna start my granddaughter on it soon, but I'm probably gonna have to pay her. But uh, yeah, if you have anybody that can help you out of this at your shop that you don't have to pay, or that you can pay very little, or we'll take it in trade. I did, I have in the past had people that worked for comics, so that also is, is very good. You know, you can't really have them as a full-time employee working for comics, but you know, part-time stuff is great uh, to have them work for it. Make sure that when you're, you have inventory for when things change so that you can pivot. In your storage area, you should have stuff that you've just, put away and just recently I went, I went down into our basement and I found 400 uh, Hot Wheels that I had completely forgotten about. And I we sell about 10 to 15 Hot Wheels a week. You know, the kids come in, the parents wanna buy them something, they're cheap, um, it's a good name. Most of mine are probably pre-2010. Uh, so, you know, we have all the way back to like 1995, but none of them are really over six bucks, you know, like seven dollars, probably top. Now we have some treasure hunts and stuff there, ridiculous money. But most of the stuff we have out is like from two bucks up to five bucks. And it's a quick item for, for parents to buy their kid if the kid's not into comics. Not every kid's into comics. But what I do do, if you got a comic shop, over buy your free comic book day comics and just keep them by the register all year long. And when a kid comes in, Make him, let him leave, even if he doesn't want a comic, let him leave with a free one. His parents will always take the free one. Always talk to the parents about how great comics are for reading comprehension, uh, because the pictures tell part of the story, it's easier to comprehend words you may not have seen before. So it is a great tool for teaching, uh, but it's important to make young readers, uh, so that later on, 
as you build these, as these kids get older and they start subscribing to books, then you have more subscribers and you won't have to pivot as much. In our area, we don't have a big uh, base, customer base. I always say I'd like to have a thousand people come through the store, spend $10 every week. That'd be $10,000 a week. All, all the employees would be happy, I would be happy, all our bills would be paid and we'd all take a salary. That doesn't happen. We have some people that spend quite a bit of money every week and then we have a few people that buy and then new people that are visiting the area coming in, we get a, an impulse buy out of that. One other thing you need to look for, uh, which we just came into, is the CDA. Um, they have them in New York. I'm pretty sure most states, local areas have. Uh, it's a community development agency. So they get money from the state and sometimes from the local government to give to businesses to develop the community. Uh, we just got $10 million for our little city. So I don't own my building, so I can't get any like remodeling um, or like painting the building or anything like that. I can't ask for any of that. But what I can ask for is marketing funds so that people, more people know about my business. So I was always afraid to put a lot of money into marketing, not knowing where, if I'm gonna get that money in return. But if I'm gonna write a grant and get a good amount of money to do a real marketing plan, where I hire somebody to you know, look into what's the best type of marketing we can do, how can I hit my target demographic. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert in everything and nobody really is. And so it's, if, if you can get the funds to do it, get an expert. You know, uh, I'm thinking about you know, being able to shoot a real commercial. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe getting it up, uh, like the movie theaters now have playing uh, at the beginning of of shows, they have local businesses on their on their thing. So I'm thinking about on there, um, you know, and a couple other different places. Maybe some radio spots because radio spots, for me, I've always felt that they were out of my league, money-wise. You know, like I've recently I've been getting some really small plans, like oh, you could spend $500, but you look at what you get for that $500, it's like a weekend, like 10 spots. You know, that's, that's $300 a spot. That's a lot. But I understand in media, that's not a lot. That's, that's a very low amount, but. So go out and look for those grants. It, it'll help in a lot of different ways. You know, if you're doing any kind of educational stuff at your shop, you know, find a 501C uh, that will sponsor it, have write the grant for them. If they get the money, then they'll pay to use your space for the, you know, if you have play space like we do. Um, you know, the Boy Scouts have a, a board gaming badge where they create board games. Um, I think the Girl Scouts have a similar one. Uh, we've done uh, art classes, but of course we didn't, we did it on our own. We didn't go out and get a 501C. Uh, but like there's another idea to go out and where you can generate interest and generate people into your shop for no money out of your pocket and it's out it's meant to be spent right it don't don't feel bad about getting uh, you know a grant uh, or some money from a from a local agency because that money somebody else in in your town is going to spend that money it's all going to get spent so go out and get it but remember, if you need an idea to pivot, just go online and look for all the stuff. And when, you know, sometimes it's a, you know, I, I'm, we'll probably throw in a little B-roll. I have a, stacks of baseball cards too that I've been buying sports cards. And we hadn't done sports cards in eight years. Like the first six months I opened, I did sports cards and they sold so slow, I just put them away and forgot about them. But now they're back in vogue and I've been selling them. So if people bring you stuff, if they call up and say, hey, I have a collection, don't just tell them no. Tell them you have to see it, look at it. The other thing that happens is you, when a collection comes in, anybody in the store wants to know what's going on. So then they start looking at it and you can tell by their expression, you can tell by their interest, whether, you know, sometimes that's a clue on whether you should buy it or not. But always just check check on eBay, what it's selling for. And if, 
and the sell through rate. Like sometimes things sell for a lot of money, but they don't, they don't hardly ever sell. Like they're selling one or two a month and there's a hundred people that have the item up. Then it's not, you know, you can't pay that high amount for it because you're going to sit on it a while. So that's a, another thing, topic that we'll probably hit on another, I'm not going to go on another tangent. I've already went on four, four tangents, supposed to be about pivoting. <laughs> I think the main theme has been pivoting, but you can keep your store alive by being fluid, being able to pivot into different items. And even if you don't have them out on your floor, store them in your back room. And when things go stale, you can bring stuff out. And the other thing is, is that if you have items that are out on your floor for a long, that's what the whole re-merchandising is. You have stuff out on the floor and it's been there a while, take it off. Like people think that it's sold. So the next time you put it back up, they're like, oh, I better grab it this time because last time it's sold. They don't know it's the same one. So it's important, get a, a hold of everything you have and get organized. And that's what we're doing because we are not. You know, I wish I could follow my own advice, but you need manpower to do that. And you should do it from the beginning. Uh, but I've bought some really, really big collections and it's really gotten away from me. So organization, pivoting, it'll keep you alive. And uh, if you got a bunch of this stuff in your attic or in your garage, either sell it to me or open a comic shop.